The Moral World, Chapter 1, Part 2, the Bhagavad Gita. This uh, section, just like the last, is trying to demonstrate the idea that morality depends upon the human relationship and that when we're talking about divine issues, it transcends beyond. Um, the story of the Bhagavad Gita comes from the Vedic tradition, and Bhagavad Gita literally means Song of the Lord, and it was part of a much longer piece called the Mahabharat, which tells about a civil war that occurred in India about 5,000 years ago at the beginning of the Kali Yuga. Uh, to many people in the world, about a billion in fact, the uh, Bhagavad Gita is sort of the Bible of the, tr of the uh, tradition. It's the spiritual guide of the people. Now the Bhagavad Gita is narrated by Sanjaya, who is a sage who relates the happenings of the text to the blind king, Dhritarashtra. And of course the fact that the king is blind has important significance. Not only is he blind in the physical sense, in the fact that he can't actually see what's happening on the battlefield, but at the same time, he's also blind from a spiritual sense because he doesn't realize the higher truth uh, as well. At the outset of the battle, uh, it's about to commence. We have these two rival fa uh, factions of a family. And the warrior Arjuna, he doesn't want to battle his family. But his charioteer, Krishna, who is God, is counseling him on why he has to fight under these circumstances. In the first teaching, um, King Dhritarashtra asks Sanjaya to tell him, you know, what's going on on the battlefield? What's going on out there? Not just on the battlefield itself, but also on the field of Dharma. And then Sanjaya is going to describe the arrangement of the armies and their readiness to fight, uh, and so on. Now, right from the get-go, when we look at this, it seems obvious who is going to win this battle and who must win this battle. Uh, the Kurus um, are engaged in battle against the Pandavas. The Pandavas are the rightful heirs, and Arjuna is the great warrior of that tradition. And we see Arjuna here uh, on this uh, chariot being driven into battle by none other than Krishna. So here is a wonderful sign of victory. We have Arjuna who is who is in the right. We have um, Krishna, who is God, who is his driver in this. Uh, we have a chariot that was given to him by Agni, the um, god of fire. And uh, the flag that's being flown is a rampant lion, or, I'm sorry, a rampant monkey, which is the uh, sign of Hanuman. Hanuman, incidentally, here's an image of Hanuman, uh, is the monkey god that becomes, uh, becomes important in the story of the Ramyan. Uh, he is a being of tremendous power, but he is so humble that he doesn't know what powers he possesses or what it is he's capable of doing unless he's reminded of this. And uh, so he becomes sort of the great uh, symbol of what it is to be a humble individual. Within the story of the Ramyan, in fact, um, when uh, Rama and Hanuman first meet each other, they recognize who each other uh, are, and Hanuman immediately falls before Rama and asks him for a teaching. In the teaching that is given, Rama says, The one who is most blessed to me the one who is most beloved to me is the one who sees himself as a servant and everyone and everything else in existence as his master. So the most humble of individual is the one who is best fit uh, to serve. So Arjuna and uh, Krishna are about to lead the um, Pandavas into battle against the Kurus. But Arjuna is having a crisis here. He sees no good in battle. It fills him with a sense of dread. Everyone else, you know, seems ready to kill. But Arjuna doesn't think it worthy, even for the sovereignty of the three worlds, and certainly not for the fleeting rain upon earth. Why should he kill his 
friends and his cousins and his kinsmen in battle. Only harm could possibly come from all of this. And the argument that um, Arjuna makes, really from a moral standpoint, makes wonderful sense. Uh, it sounds tremendously like the type of argument that um, Gandhi might make, that it would be better to die as a pauper, that it would be better to um, give up and throw down your arms than to kill your kinsmen, because by doing so, aren't you committing a terrible harm? Aren't you going to bring all kinds of karmic harm upon yourself? But Krishna counsels him that this is not the case. And so in um, the beginning of battle, we see the sign where uh, all of the various military leaders are blowing their conch shells. It's very common in battle up until really the early 20th century that part of going into battle was making a tremendous amount of noise to intimidate and frighten the enemy. Well, when uh, each one blows their conch shell, we're told what the shell signifies. When we come to Krishna's shell, however, we're told that it's a transcendent sound, that it's transcending beyond all boundaries. And because of this noise, when Arjuna asks for the battle to be halted, and it just simply stops for about an hour. And during that hour, Krishna and Arjuna will speak, and this is the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita that are revealed to Arjuna in about an hour's time. But yet this is knowledge that the rest of mankind has been spending millennia trying to figure out and trying ultimately to get right. So Arjuna uh, is going to ask for the battle to be halted and Krishna allows that to happen and they begin conversation with each other. They begin discussion. And so if we take a look in your text, we have part of um, the text, we have the second teaching presented to us, and I just want to highlight a few key things. When Arjuna makes this uh, statement, Krishna responds in this way, Why this cowardice in time of crisis, Arjuna? The coward is ignoble, is shameful, foreign to the ways of heaven. Don't yield to impotence, it's unnatural in you. Banish this petty weakness from your heart. Rise to the fight, Arjuna. But Arjuna responds, Krishna, how can I fight against Bhishma and Drona with arrows when they deserve my worship? It's better in this world to beg for scraps of food than to eat meals smeared with the blood of the elders that I killed at the height of their power while their goals were still desires. So again, if I take the life of my cousins and kinsmen, then I am destroying that individual. I'm killing those people uh, at a very crucial and critical point in their life and in their existence. And so it's going to bring terrible karmic harm upon me. But Krishna's counsel, he says, you grieve for those beyond grief and you speak words of insight, but learned men do not grieve for the dead or the living. Never have I not existed, nor you, nor these kings, and never in the future shall we cease to exist. Just as the embodied self enters childhood, youth, and old age, so does it enter another body. It does not confound the steadfast man. Contacts with matter make us feel heat and cold, pleasure and pain. Arjuna, you must learn to endure fleeting things. They come and go. When these cannot torment a man, when suffering and joy are equal for him and he has courage, he is fit for immortality. Our bodies are known to end, but the embodied self is enduring, indestructible, and immeasurable. Therefore, Arjuna, fight the battle. Basically, what he's reminding us is that our bodies uh, are part of this physical world. They are temporary things. They're like articles of clothing that you might strip on and strip off or a house that you go into and live in for a certain number of years, but then you leave it and go to another house. That's what our body is. But the real self, which is the soul, is immortal. 
because it is part and parcel of the divine. It's part and parcel of Krishna. So that being the case, um, a soul does not, it's not born. It doesn't die. Having been, it will never not be. Unborn, enduring, constant, and primordial, it's not killed when the body is killed. So if we could understand the basic metaphysics of the universe, which is that we are not these physical bodies. We are instead the spirit soul that dwells within them. Then the fact is that you may kill that body out on the battlefield, but you've not killed that individual. That person may transcend to greatness. It may be reborn into this world to be given a, another opportunity, another chance. But the soul will continue on. You haven't killed anyone. The fact of the matter is, Arjuna is told, the battle itself is something that's going to happen. The only real question is whether he's going to fulfill his duty within it. Is Arjuna going to do his part or is he going to fight against it? And that's where the real sense of choice, that's where the real sense of freedom starts to come into play. As an individual, Arjuna has to make that choice as to what it is to do. Just like in the last lecture we talked about Abraham and Isaac, uh, he had to make that choice, he had to make that decision. Do I take this child to the mountaintop? Do I offer him for sacrifice? Not because it's morally right, because clearly it isn't morally right to kill this innocent child. But do I do it because God has commanded it and I have absolute faith and trust in God that there is a reason, even though I may not understand what it is, there is a reason why this must happen. Arjuna is put in that exact same position. He has to come to understand that this choice is his. He can fight against this battle. He can run away from it. But that's all that he's capable of doing. He will never be able to stop it. The people who are on that battlefield have already won the ones that are going to win and they've already lost the ones that are going to lose. They've already been uh, killed, the ones that are going to die. But again, it's not anything but that physical husk that has died. The actual body lives on. The actual spirit, rather, is what lives on, even though the body may be killed, may be composed, may be traded. So will Arjuna fulfill his duty? And that's what this ultimately comes down to, is a question of duty. Just as Abraham had a duty to obey God and he chose to do so, Arjuna has a duty to obey God's command, which is to say that as he was born a Kshatriya, it is his duty to go into this battle, to fight, to win back what is right. The Kurus have corrupted things so horribly that things must be put right. And it is up to him to do so. God will see that what needs to be done is done, but will Arjuna fulfill his role? Will he have enough faith to be willing to embrace it, to be willing to accept it? And so it takes the course of the Bhagavad Gita for Arjuna to, re uh, to have this information revealed to him. But in the end, we will find Arjuna becoming submissive to, uh, to God, to Lord Krishna, and he will embrace this ultimate knowledge and this truth. He will fulfill his sense of duty and therefore have done what must be done. You know, the battle of Kurukshetra is an actual historical battle. It did take place. But the real battle is the battle that took place in Arjuna's mind. He was placed in that situation because he was at this point of crisis. Can he come to that position of ultimate faith? Can he transcend beyond morality? And that is what Arjuna does within the Bhagavad Gita.